capital of the presentation. It's starting to continue to do my transformation. My name is Javier de Yoma, or Adrian, if you want to pronounce it in English. Uh, in this presentation, I want to share experiences starting up the continuous delivery project with our clients. And I want to share our experience from the uh, past six months. I will be referring in general terms to the client rather than talk about the client's specifics. Because for this presentation, the interesting things is in the continuous delivery patterns that are the habit of the experience. Um, and we'll talk for 45 minutes. Okay. I will talk for 45 minutes and then I um, have uh, 15 minutes for questions. So the only thing is standing in between uh, you and your lunch, that's me, that's Andrew's place. Okay. Um, so my name is Adrian Leona. I work as a consultant for a company called Zivia, or in Dutch we pronounce Xavia. Zidia is a consultancy company. We do consultancy in well, HR coaching, uh, software development, and architecture. And in the architecture business unit, we're doing lots of stuff on continuous delivery. Uh, related to Zidia, it's Zidia Labs. You'll see the stand in the sponsor um, area. Uh, Zidia Labs is a product company. It's under the same owner. And I don't work for Labs, but I work for Zidia, which is the um, I like to work on things that are <laughs> Okay. Oh, now I hear myself also. Even better. Um, I like to work on things that are half technical and half organizational. And continuous delivery turns out to be a very good um, example of this. In my spare time, I like to write a little bit. Um, I like internet technologies, so I've written two books about internet technology. But more recently, and that um, was for Zibia, we wrote this book on continuous delivery. Uh, don't get me wrong, there already was an excellent book on continuous delivery written by Dave Farley and Jeff Sumble. But we found that when we gave this to a manager, uh, that they thought, ah, this is too technical, this is too thick, so they quickly gave it to their team. So in order to explain continuous delivery to managers, who are the decision makers, we found that we were making PowerPoint slides over and over and over again. And we wanted to solve that with this book, which is nice and thin, and in uh, manager's terms. So. Um, first of all, how do you become a continuous delivery consultant? I used to consider myself a software architect and before that a Java developer, mostly in internet technologies. And then someday my um, employer had a new assignment for two people, one software architect and one continuous delivery uh, consultant. So I said, yay, nice, I'm going to work together with a continuous delivery consultant. Then I said, well, yeah, about that. So I was the continuous delivery consultant. Um, how do you start a continuous delivery transformation? You may think there will be a client coming to you and asking you to start a continuous delivery transformation. Um, in my experience, they will not. Clients will typically ask for a sub uh, um, some um, sub-department will ask for a local optimization but a whole department completely transforming, they will typically not ask you that. Instead, they'll come to you with a problem. And the problem might be something like, we have a problem in our release cycle. And if they have a problem in their release cycle, you offer one audit. One audit with two people during two weeks, Actually, it took a month because we were working part-time. And what we found there was what they told us, a broken release cycle. There were so many incidents in the release cycle that you actually wondered how they did manage to get software into production anyway. 
uh, which really is an accom accomplishment, given that they are constantly firefighting, constantly having escalations. So we started searching for the root cause of this problem. And while searching for the root cause of the problem, we felt a little bit like this. You recognize these guys? Uh, they are the two consultants from Office Space. If you haven't seen that, you should really see Office Space. It's a classic. Uh, we started with a group of people, the core team, um, doing uh, workshops, uh, making a large value stream on the wall, um, drawing on the other wall um, all their environments and noting the differences between the environments. And after these workshops, we did in-depth interviews with specific people, each targeted towards their area. And the pattern that you saw there is that people from Department A, they said, hey, we're doing fine, but there's a problem with Department B. And Department B said, hey, we're doing fine, but there's a problem with Department A and Department C. And you can guess Department C was blaming Department D, and Department D was the blaming Department A again. But everybody thought their piece was going well. And still, also, everybody agrees that if you look at the total process, there was something really going wrong. So what we concluded from this is that the problem is not in one department. It's not a simple problem. Um, we did see that there is a problem if you look at the total of all the departments cooperating. So you should have a look at organizational anti-patterns. Uh, let's start with a familiar one, the waterfall approach. This is a nice picture of a waterfall. Actually, I wish that waterfall in IT would look like this, because in this waterfall, for waterfall there's actually flow. Uh, I would uh, suggest to replace the word waterfall with the word water sluice, if I'm translating it correctly to English, and that we call this sluice, because there's this large batch of water coming all the time, but in small, um, yeah, it takes a long time before the batch is opened. But metaphor set aside, I believe you get the image. Another problem is in integration. A typical anti-pattern you see in integration is uh, early branching and late merging and branches for each project. This picture is actually an understatement for what we found there. In practice, they did not have only separate branches for each project, but on top of the pro project branches, there were even sub-branches for each change within the project. And all these branches kept open until the last minute, and just before the two-month cycle to go to testing, they would integrate, and you can guess what happens. All the pain of integration comes at the end, just when it needs to go to testing. Their problem was that if they needed to go to their test environment, for which they had a four-week period, and a one-week period for installation in test environment, on average it took two weeks to get the test environment up and running. The date to go from test environment to the next environment to acceptance did not move. So the total period available for manual testing went from three weeks to two weeks. And you can imagine what that does with the number of incidents that ha happen in the next environment. If you look at the release process and the stages, development, test, acceptance, production, and the way I drew it here, again, you see a waterfall. But it's a little bit worse than just a waterfall. There are different teams maintaining the systems in each stage of the release process. There is different technology used in different stages of the release process. Um, there are different packages going to different stages of the release process. There's actually a different package being tested and another other package going into production. I think I don't have to tell you what's wrong with that picture. And I think uh, the audience here can easily imagine how best practices from the world of continuous delivery can help out here. 
However, our client hired us with an assignment, hey, we need some help with the, um, our lease cycle. They did not ask for continuous delivery. So it's to go from, we need some help with the release cycle to proposing a continuous delivery transformation. That's a big change for them. You have to imagine a manager who knows nothing about continuous delivery, haven't, hasn't even heard of it, um, and convincing them that they need to make this big change. It takes some um, convincing and you need to take some time. This is one of the things we, I think, did uh, well. During the four weeks period, we very early on started managing expectations. From the first week, uh, at least once a week, we wanted to sit down with the managers who hired us and talk with them. And the first thing to do here is simply tell them what you see. Uh, state facts, not opinions. You can tell them we see different teams taking care of different env environments d throughout the release cycle. You can tell them, we see that a different package goes into production than the package that, what, than that was, was tested. Even a manager without knowledge of continuous delivery knows that there's something wrong there. We see developers who are only responsible during development and when the package goes to test, they're no longer responsible. If they have an incident in the test environment, they need, they need to get the developer off their other project to get to fix it in testing. You can simply explain that. Uh, when there's an incident in production, there's a whole different team that fixes that. So developers are never confronted with the things that go into production. Um, the managers, they encouraged us to be blunt, blunt about our um, findings. But actually, when you just state the facts, there's no need to give uh, a value to that. Next thing we did is that long before the end presentation of our investigation, um, we gave a sneak preview of what we were going to tell. So already early on, we started talking about continuous delivery. Um, already early on, we started saying, hey, what we see here is not just a technical problem. We see an organizational problem. And we believe you should use agile methodologies to fix this. As a result, they started asking us, hey, that's interesting, continuous delivery. Can you come to our team leaders meeting and tell our team leaders a little bit more about continuous delivery? So an additional presentation. They invited us to the management team meeting and say, hey, can you tell us a little bit more about Agile? Long before the end results of our um, investigation. Some might say, hey, that is scope creep. You have to ask extra money for that during your investigation. Uh, yeah, it's scope creep. And yeah, it posed us some challenges to get the work finished in time with the extra work of the extra presentations. But I believe that these early presentations were important to get towards the proposal of uh, proposing a continuous delivery transformation. So then the end of the investigation, we ended with a proposal a continuous delivery transformation, including an agile transformation. And this did not come as a surprise, but mainly we gave the details, the details about how many people we needed, what we needed from them, uh, what it would cost.